Good morning and good afternoon to all of our audience today. Hello and welcome to this edition of our global webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Capacitive Power Supplies. My name is David Adib and I am the Senior Technical Marketing Engineer here with Kemet based in Florida and I will moderate the webinar today. We're very pleased that you can find the time to join our webinar today. We have our presenter, Pranjal Strevasa, field application engineer based in Europe. With this information, I'll hand it over to Pranjal. Hello, Pranjal, good afternoon to you and thank you for joining us today. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on capacitive power supplies, <clears throat> power supplies which do not use a transformer for stepping down AC voltage. Usually, our Kemet webinars are focused on high voltage, high power applications. So today, we have decided to focus on an application that is perhaps more suited for low power, well, uh, for low power requirements, or more suited for low power applications, approximately below five watts or so. But maybe some of you also use such supplies for higher power applications or after the webinar today might be inclined to use it for slightly higher power applications as well. Uh, my name is Pranjal Srivastava and I am a field application engineer at Kemet, responsible presently for Central Europe. I am with Kemet for almost three years now. And prior to joining Kemet, I have four years experience as an automotive design and development engineer with some tier one and tier two suppliers. I hold a master's degree in microsystems engineering from University of Freiburg, Germany. So I would start first with some basics of capacitive power supplies where I have used some very simple LT spy simulations to demonstrate how they work and what sort of an impact does increase or decrease of these capacitances have. This would be followed by fitting technologies for such power supplies followed by a film and MLCC series at Kemet that are well suited for capacitive voltage dividers or capacitive supplies. I would conclude with a section comparing MLCCs and film capacitor based solution for such power supplies. <clears throat> All right, so with that said, we'll begin our webinar with our first poll question, which I have just launched to our audience. So uh, our audience should be able to see this, the question appear on their screens. And the question asks uh, about the typical power rating of your applications driven by AC mains. So um, I will give it a second here for the answers to come through. And um, all right, so Pranjal, I think it's a split between the first option below uh, five watts and above five watts, uh, above 100 watts, excuse me, the fourth option. So uh, the first option received about 26% of the answers and the last one received about 29% of the answers. Okay, that's interesting to note. Of course, for applications below five watts, this is, this is a very good application or, or this is a very good uh, methodology of supplying power to your application. For higher, for higher power applications, there are of course solutions present on the market, which I would be also shortly uh, showing in my presentation, but definitely for, for requirements above 100 watts, this could be a bit of a challenge, but let's see, maybe we could do something about that as well. So let's start first with the basics of capacitive power supplies, where I'll demonstrate using very simple LT spice simulations as to how they work and what impact does change in capacitance have on the output. So starting first with a very simple LT spice simulation of a 10 kilo ohm load connected to a 50 Hertz to 30 volts RMS or 320 volts peak European standard AC main supply. So without any other impedance connected in series, we get a perfect 320 volt peak AC main signal across the load. So nothing surprising about this. And this is exactly what we expect. However, if we now connect a 100 nanofarad capacitor in series to the AC mains, we can effectively step down the original green AC mains voltage from 320 volts peak down to the red approximately 93 volts peak. So after looking at these two simulations, it's clear that if we connect a capacitor in series to AC mains, the AC mains voltage will be stepped down. 
Now here I've taken an example of an AC to DC power converter with or without a capacitor in series to the AC mains. This is of course a very simple model for simulation sake. In reality, of course, such converters have many more components and look more complicated. This is a very simplistic simulation test bench. And without a capacitor in series to the AC mains, the AC mains voltage is simply rectified to 330 volts DC with some voltage ripples that depends, of course, also on the load of the filter capacitance. However, if we put a 15 nanofarad capacitor in series to the AC mains, the voltage at the output of the rectifier is not only rectified, but also stepped down to approximately five volts. Very important also to note here that the IRMS flowing through or, or the uh, average current, average AC current flowing through the capacitor is 1.1 milliampere. I have used here only the standard LT spice capacitor and the current values shown here and on the next slide are purely for comparison's sake. Now, if the 15 nanofarad capacitor is replaced by a 10 nanofarad capacitor, the rectified voltage is stepped further, is stepped down further to approximately 3.3 volts, and the IRMS through the capacitor also drops to 0.7 milliampere from 1.1 milliampere on the last slide. The fall in both voltage as well as current is proportional to each other. If the capacitance is reduced further down to 5.6 nanofarad, the rectified voltage is stepped down further to 1.8 volts from the 3.3 volts before, and IRMS through the capacitor is stepped down further to 0.4 milliampere from 0.7 milliampere on the previous slide, both again proportional to each other. So based on the simulations on the last slides, what were some of the obvious conclusions? Firstly, the higher was the capacitance, lesser was the AC voltage drop across the capacitor, Secondly, the higher was the capacitance, more was the IRMS current through the capacitor. So what does this mean? This means that lower capacitance leads to higher impedance, which in turn means more AC voltage drop and lower RMS current. So if you need more RMS current, then you, then you for sure need higher capacitance. But what if that capacitance, with that capacitance, you cannot step it down enough to your desired voltage as higher capacitance also means lower AC voltage drop. To understand and apply these points better, we need to understand the theory and the science behind these observations. A lot of this theory might already be very well known to almost everyone in the audience, I assume, but a good picture of this theory in mind is essential to understanding this application and to also suggest the right capacitor technology for such applications. A capacitor is more space efficient and creates less losses than a transformer, especially when dealing with low power applications where it opposes AC current flow due to its AC impedance, which unlike a resistive voltage drop does not create any additional heat or losses. Only a minimum amount of energy is lost in the form of heat due to the ESR of such capacitors or equivalent series resistance of such capacitors. The capacitive reactance of such capacitors is inversely proportional to frequency and impedance increases with, with this capacitive reactance, which is the wanted property. And unfortunately, also ESR is something that leads to the increase in impedance, which is the unwanted property. Hence, in order to efficiently step down AC voltage, the key determinant really is the dissipation factor, which is a ratio of ESR and capacitive impedance. So if you need more RMS current for your load, but at the same time also want the voltage to be stepped down to, to a lower voltage, you need a capacitance low enough and a capacitor that can do it with a very low ESR or lower losses. This means you could also conduct higher current. Therefore, ideally you would want a part with as low a dissipation factor as possible. Okay, so now uh, we come to our second poll question for the day, which I just pushed through to our audience. And the question asks, what is the typical methodology you use for stepping down AC voltage? No frequency change, only amplitude. And this is a single choice question. So there can only be one answer, one correct answer at a time. So as the questions are coming through, uh, I do have a question for you, for, for you, Pranjal, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. um, so in order for a resistor to be connected 
um, in series and in, in, in capacitive supplies, does it have to have any special properties or characteristics that you can share with us? Yeah, well, resistors are used primarily to prevent a short circuiting between the power lines in case the capacitor fails short circuit. So ideally, you would want the resistor to cause less losses during the actual operation. Mm -hmm. So a resistor with a low resistance value, but, but high enough power dissipation capability would be ideal for such supplies. And of course, if there is any requirement, then with our, uh, with our Yagio chip resistors portfolio, as well as uh, the other special uh, PhD resistors portfolio, you might also have the right alternative for your requirements. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so I see here that we have a clear winner uh, as far as the answers to the poll question go. Uh, Transformers uh, received 48% of the votes today. That's interesting. Actually, 50%. Because, all right. This is interesting because uh, we also saw that a, a large portion of the audience also voted for, for power supplies that are below 5 watts. So what this means is that they maybe through in this presentation, there would be something interesting which could convince the audience in the future to also consider capacitive power supplies for stepping down AC voltage. Yes, of course, the, uh, the, the, uh, the isolation between the, between the power planes is something which you probably would not get from such capacitive power supplies, but if that really is not such a crucial thing for your requirement and for your application, then such capacitive power supplies can really be something that can be very useful for your downsizing and to make your, your design more cost and space friendly. So capacitive power supplies are basically power supplies that use capacitive voltage dividers, as I also showed on the previous LT spy simulations, to step down AC mains, in other words, transformer-less power supplies. As we already saw, higher is the current requirement, higher would be the needed capacitance, but bigger capacitances mean also less of a voltage drop and also typically a bigger, bulkier component. And this is why typically such power supplies are limited to low power applications, which run on small currents, typically up to single digit milliampere, or maybe you could go up to double digit milliampere, but, but not typically exceeding this current range. And they need small capacitance values to step down the voltage to a low value needed by such applications, ranging typically in the 3.3 volts to 5 volts, or maybe could go up to 20 volts range. For these power supplies to function reliably, the capacitor needs to be stable with the applied voltage, environmental conditions, and specified lifetime. In many cases, an X2 rating is needed to avoid any catastrophic failures in case the capacitor fails in a short circuit. However, if a series resistor is used as well, then X2 rating may or may not be needed. And typical applications include low power loads running directly using energy from AC mains, for example, lighting and LED modules for commercial, industrial, or white goods usage, smart home and smart meter applications, and other similar low power commercial and industrial appliances. Smart energy management and control is, is also one of the market sectors where we, where we are seeing this, uh, this capacitive power supply methodology being used to step down the AC voltage. I mean, of course, in general, if you have an application where, where the power requirements is not exceeding five watts or is not going too much in, uh, too deep into the double figure or double digit watt, watt range, then capacitive power supplies for sure can help you a lot in, in downsizing and saving uh, on space on your boards because the transformer is effectively replaced by a small capacitor. So fitting capacitor technologies for capacitive power supplies, based on the requirements we highlighted on the previous slide, let's try and find fitting technologies or dielectrics which are well suited for capacitive power supplies by the process of elimination. So firstly, the technology should be able to work with AC voltages, which is where unipolar technologies such as tantalum and electrolytic capacitors get crossed out I have also crossed out film DC link here as they are supposed to only filter out AC ripples, which are a small, small percentage or small fraction of the actual DC link line voltage, but are not ideal really for pure AC applications. Stability with voltage and temperature, which is where class two and class three MLCC dielectrics get crossed out. 
A very important criteria is also low to medium high AC current carrying capability. So the selected technologies already by the process of elimination are all capable of conducting IRMS uh, in double or triple digit milliampere range. So it would be the film EMI capacitors, pulse capacitors such as R75 and MLCC, C0G or NP0 based capacitors, which, which I would cover in the next slides. Please be careful when I say single or double digit milliampere, I mean the current capability at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Usually the data sheets mention such current values at much higher frequencies around 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, or maybe one kilohertz and so on. So current capability at 50 hertz or 60 hertz comparatively is much lower. On later slides, I've shown how to calculate the IRMS uh, or the max IRMS at such low frequencies based on data from higher frequencies. So I now move on to film options. Uh, and also calculations for capacitive power supplies based on data that, that we get for these film capacitors uh, for higher frequencies. So the main trends in our EMI film capacitors has been performance and stability at high temperatures and humidity coupled with miniaturization. That's the reason why we presently offer a very versatile safety capacitors portfolio, ideal for a place and cost optimal capacitive power supply with our miniaturized X2 caps like the R52 and R53, offering some of the highest CV values for X2 caps in the market. For X2 with 125 degrees Celsius capability, we have another series which is not mentioned here and would most likely not be needed in capacitive supply applications. But in terms of robustness at temperatures up to 105 degrees Celsius or 110 degrees Celsius, R52, R53, as well as the FH62 V054 are our best offerings. V054 in FH62 stands for non-halogen free. So we offer this part as halogen free as well as non-halogen free. And non-halogen free variant is of course more cost effective. R75H is not a safety rated series, is nonetheless a series well suited for capacitive power supply applications if no safety rating is needed, but at the same time, the load needs a higher current to be driven. This capacitor we usually recommend for snubber or for resonant applications, but can still very well be used in capacitive voltage dividers, simply because of its thicker but single metallization and high AC voltage as well as current carrying capability. At the same time, it's only single metallized, so would still give you a place optimal solution as compared to some double metallized film capacitors, which would be more bigger and, and over dimension for these applications. H here stands for high temperature as the series can be operated up to 125 degrees Celsius for 2000 hours. In general, if your capacitive voltage divider requirements cannot be fulfilled using an X2 capacitor due to the high RMS, IRMS capability, and there is a series resistor present, so an X2 rating is not needed. R75H is a good technology in that case to suggest. Moving on to IRMS and VRMS calculations for film capacitors at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. And so typically IRMS and VRMS values in film data sheets are, are only mentioned down to 100 hertz, but usually not below this. Generally for frequencies above 100 hertz, which is the region B in these graphs, the usual thermal calculations apply for calculating IRMS and VRMS values, which means IRMS and VRMS are limited by the maximum allowed self-heating of the component, which in turn depends on its ESR and thermal resistivity or heat transfer coefficient. Theory and the maths is shown here on the bottom right side of, of the slide for the region B. However, this math for 50 or 60 hertz changes because this frequency belongs to the low frequency range denoted by A here, where max VRMS allowed is constant and is therefore determined and, and it's constant because it is determined by corona discharge voltage or VCD. This means that for such low frequencies, corona discharge takes precedence over thermal dissipation requirements and therefore the max VRMS in this frequency range is limited by VCD and so remains constant. And since ESR is also constant in this frequency range, the max IRMS changes therefore purely with the capacitive reactance and is therefore directly proportional to frequency. So if you know the IRMS of a part at 100 Hertz, you can calculate its IRMS current at 50 Hertz 
using simple proportionality. To demonstrate it practically for one of our X2 rated film capacitors, 150 nanofarad R52 part, from its data sheet, we can see its IRMS capability at 100 Hertz is equal to 12 milliamperes. And using the direct proportionality between frequency and current at lower frequencies, we can simply divide 24 milliampere, which results in an IRMS capability of 12 milliampere. This means that this part can be used to drive loads up to 12 milliampere AC RMS current. In case your load needs more than 12 milliamperes, let's say more than 100 milliamperes, then non-safety rated high current capable series such as R75 shown previously come more into the picture. As we see on this data sheet, for currents up to approximately 100 milliamperes up, up divided by two is equal to, which equals 50 milliampere, an X2 rated capacitor is good enough. To summarize it, a comparison between our X2 rated series and non X2 rated series for such capacitive voltage dividers is shown in this table. For the same 150 nanofarad requirement, the overall solution using R52 is the smallest and is also low profile compared to the other solutions. But if your load needs more current, which cannot be supplied using an X2 rated capacitor, then a pulse capacitor like R75H would be needed due to its very low dissipation factor. And not to forget the higher TV by DT could also play a very important role to avoid gradual deterioration due to high inrush currents over a period of time. So although these three capacitors offer the same AC reactants, depending on the load and the actual current requirements, if an X2 rating is not needed, then R75 would be the most energy efficient solution and can drive more load. As the lead spacing for R75 goes up, so does its max RMS current capability for the same voltage or capacitance value, which means even higher load can actually be driven. Okay, so now we come to our third poll question for the day. And the question says, do you need an X2 rating in case your application already uses a capacitive voltage divider? And once again, this is a single choice question. So there can only be one correct answer. And uh, while we're waiting on the answers to come through from our audience, uh, Pranjal, I have a question about the corona discharge uh, effect and how it, how it impacts film capacitors. Okay. So basically, corona discharge is an, is an electrical discharge caused by, the, caused by the ionization of a fluid such as air when it surrounds a conductor carrying a high voltage. So it is basically a localized phenomena where air or some other fluid, uh, it undergoes some electrical breakdown and becomes conductive allowing locally the charge to continuously leak off the conductor into the air. In film capacitors uh, operating at mains voltage, this, this phenomena could cause some local vaporization of metal or, 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 or desorption sort of, of charge. This is why, as also shown on previous slides, at AC mains frequencies, we have a max defined corona discharge voltage, which the AC voltage across the capacitor should not typically exceed. Okay. And uh, it looks like 59% of our audience has um, have chosen the uh, always answer, the option number A, as an answer to this question. Is that what you would uh, have expected, Pranjal? Yes, I think this goes very much, very much with what I had expected. Because what we also see in many cases, even despite using a resistor in series uh, for for more safety, uh, to enable more safety in, uh, or, and to avoid any risk of a short circuit, uh, many customers still are more inclined on using an X2 capacitor for these capacitive dividers because it has traditionally been like that. And this is why through this webinar, I'm, we are at least trying to attempt from our side that maybe if an X2 rating is not needed, you could increase the power rating of your capacitive supply. And this could maybe help you in downsizing your application. Thank you. Anyways, yeah. So go we'll ahead with the presentation now. And now we move on to ceramic capacitor option and calculation for such power supplies. The capacitive power supplies were, in fact, one of the focus applications for which we had introduced our safety rated SMD MLCC series, the CAS series, as well as the non safety rated CAN series, which, which I would be covering later. 
especially the C0G based CES capacitors, uh, as they are much more stable than their X7R counterparts. Uh, presently, we have CAS capacitors available up to 250 volts AC rated voltages and in 1808 to 2225K sizes. They are rated as both X1, Y2 as well as X2. For such capacitive power supplies, X2 rating is more relevant than the Y2 or X1 rating. And, and I mean, this is typically what we have seen. And also because an X2 rated capacitor gives more capacitance values to choose from for the same voltage and size. And this is how the in internal construction of these safety rated SMD MSCCs looks like. It utilizes this serial electrode design due to which in case there is a crack, it only leads to a shorting between two adjacent electrodes, but not a direct short between the two electrodes. This might at the end lead to a small drop in capacitance, but would at least not result in a catastrophic failure. Flex terminations would also be available for these MLCCs in the future for added safety. These are the available capacitance values with CAS capacitors using C0G dielectric. We have capacitance possibilities up to 1000 picofarad or one nanofarad. It is not as high as we saw with film capacitors, but a good step down solution, especially for really low current applications or low power applications uh, would, be, uh, would be very much one of those applications for which this, this uh, CES series would be used. And as we already saw, smaller capacitance leads to higher reactance, which in turn leads to a higher voltage drop across the capacitor. So all in all, a compact SMD solution for a higher step down voltage, but requiring low load current. And in case higher capacitance values are needed in order to drive relatively higher power loads, then CAN, the non-safety rated series comes in, uh, which is which is basically the non-safety rated version for of the safety rated CAS uh, series that was discussed on the previous slides. It is similar to the R75H we discussed for film capacitors, which come into picture when current capability of an X2 capacitor are not enough to drive the load and when X2 rating is not needed. So similar to CAS series, these are also rated up to 250 volts, but since these are not safety rated, they have a higher range of capacitances to choose from. Flex terminations are already available for these parts. However, serial electrode design as shown for CAS series previously may or may not be used for these parts. It depends completely on the specific part number uh, under discussion. So as with CAS, we limit our discussion even for non-safety rated CAN series to the C0G dielectric. We have capacitance capabilities with C0G here up to 33 nanofarads, which is now extended up to 120 nanofarads after the latest releases that we've had. So CAN can be used for driving higher power loads if we compare to CAS. Also compared to film capacitors, C0G dielectric MLCCs can conduct more current for the same volume. So overall, the solution would be very compact, especially if you're looking to drive load currents in single digit milliampere range. Now moving on to IRMS calculation at 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz, similar to film capacitors, data, even if including our online simulation tool KSIM is not given for low frequencies like 50 Hertz for our MLCCs. So we use again some theory to calculate IRMS at 50 Hertz, but the theory this time is not as complicated as maybe it was for film caps where we had to take Corona discharge into account. So no such phenomenon as Corona discharge happens for MLCCs. So assuming dissipation factor is constant, we can derive that ESR at 50 Hertz is twice that of ESR at 100 Hertz. So inverse proportionality with frequency, it is of course easy to calculate capacitive reactance or XC at 50 Hertz using the basic expression as shown here. Hence, we can then calculate the impedance Z at 50 Hertz and then dividing the max rated AC voltage by the impedance Z gives you then the needed IRMS current. To demonstrate this practically for a 27 nanofarad CAN MLCC, we see from our online simulation tool KSIM that ESR at 100 Hertz is 6.42 ohms. So ESR at 50 Hertz is, is 12.84 ohm because it's twice the value at, at 100 Hertz as, as shown on the previous slide. 
which means that, and the XC or the capacitive reactance for 27 nanofarad at 50 hertz is calculated by this expression here, which results in 108 kilo ohms. Hence, we can find out Z as shown here, which is approximately 108 kilo ohms as 108 kilo ohms or the capacitive reactance is much higher than the 12.84 ohms of equivalent series resistance. Then upon dividing 250 volts, which is the max rated AC voltage with the impedance, we get an IRMS max of approximately 2.31 milliampere. Further exemplifying the fact that CA and MLCCs are very well suited for loads needing current in the single digit milliampere range and hence ideally suited for LED lighting industries, for example. Because we have discussed two technologies till now for the same application, it would only be apt to end this presentation with a quick comparison between the two for capacitive power supplies. Size effectiveness, MLCC when hands, when hands down, expectedly so, but of course you only get a certain maximum capacitance with MLCCs for these applications. Whereas with film capacitors, you can easily go into hundreds of nanofarads range for this application. Cost effectiveness, CAS and CAN series are recently launched, so they are becoming more and more cost competitive uh, with time. Yeah, when I say recently launched, I mean uh, launched launched more than a year back, but it's still very recent when we compare it with our uh, with our standard film EMI capacitors. Uh, in general, an MLCC is a cheaper technology than film, but perhaps for this application, uh, film products from Kemet might still give you a slight cost advantage, especially uh, the safety rated EMI caps, which would be cheaper than the safety rated MLCC since, since they've been also there uh, and, and we've been producing them for a long time. Uh, film caps have the, high, have, have the highest cap possibilities from amongst the two technologies and therefore have the ability to drive higher current loads extending well into the double digit milliampere range. MLCCs are better at handling higher temperatures and with long lifetime. Also C0G as dielectrics have an incredibly high inrush current or dV by dt capability. Lifetime for both capacitors is actually very good, but when coupled with environmental influences such as high temperature and humidity, MLCCs outperform film capacitors. Also, the capacitance is very stable with applied voltage for both technologies. And this is why they were selected in the first place to function as, as capacitive voltage dividers. In terms of a safe failure mode, film capacitor is absolutely the safest technology in the market, as we know, uh, due to its self-healing effect. There have been already webinars on this, on this topic of self-healing effect before, in case you're not aware of self-healing effect. So, you could perhaps have a look at any Kemet webinar on EMI or safety capacitors or AC mains to power supply. You will for sure get a good idea about self-healing effect in one of those webinars or presentations. Okay. And normally by this time, we will have a uh, summary of the key takeaways, but this time uh, Pranjal has actually chosen to do something a little bit different, which is to make the T K uh, key, excuse me, key takeaways in a form of a poll question. So our audience should be able to see eight different statements on their screens right now, numbered from one to eight. So if you can please go ahead and select whether each of these sentences is true or false as it pertains to capacitive power supply applications. So for each um, of these sentences or statements, you'll see an option to choose true or false. So please go ahead and submit your answers. And as we're waiting on the answers to come through, uh, Pranjal, I have a question for you. Between the um, option of flex termination or serial electrode design, um, as in the case of a cast capacitor, which one would be safer of the two? Um, to, to you know, like to prevent against things like short a short circuit, for example, in your opinion. Uh, so so the way serial, uh, serial electrode design works, uh, it is for sure the safer of the two technologies as the risk of, of a shorting between the two electrodes is really, really very low. With, with flex terminations, uh, only the bending capability is improved, but in case that max threshold is exceeded, a risk of a short is always there because of the way it's, it's constructed internally, it follows, it follows the conventional MLCC uh, construction methodology. However, I also see why designers might prefer flex termination at times, mainly because you get a higher capacitance from the same size and voltage rating. 
and also one would want to avoid getting any cracks whatsoever inside an MLCC. So even if it does not directly lead to a shot between the two electrodes, uh, it, it's, it's still something that, uh, that someone would want, would want to avoid. But, but for this, one needs to be certain that the max bending threshold of the flex termination would not be exceeded, of course. And some of our automotive MLCCs, uh, we, we often now have, we actually offer with both together. So we also offer flex termination along with, uh, with the serial electrode design for, for additional safety. Okay. Thank you, Pranjal. And just as a reminder to our audience, as they answer uh, the fourth and last poll question, if you have a question for Pranjal, uh, please go ahead and send it through the Q&A uh, function of your Zoom window. You typically uh, are able to find that function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In the meantime, I also have another question for you, Pranjal. The, um, the, uh, the Canon CAS series are rated up, into, up, uh, up to 250 volts, if I remember correctly. Um, is there a plan to make an extension to that sometime in the future, in the near future? Yeah, so for now, they're rated up to 250 volts AC RMS. So this is important to emphasize, that's not peak, but that's actually RMS, uh, 250 volts AC up to which, to which they're rated. And as far as I know, there is an extension planned up to 270 volts AC, or maybe more than that in the coming days. But when exactly would it be launched? Uh, the exact date is, is not really known to me. But it's not known to me, but I know that there is something already uh, happening in the background to increase the voltage range beyond 250 volts AC. Okay, so let's uh, quickly summarize here the answers that uh, we have received so far. Uh, so for the first sentence, uh, by connecting a capacitor in parallel to AC main, mains, voltage amplitude can be stepped down. And it seems uh, that most of our audience has answered false to that uh, statement. Is yes. that the correct answer? Yes, yes. So okay. instead of parallel, if I put series here, then the statement would have been true. But because I wrote parallel, so this is, this is then a false statement. All right. And, and this is the correct answer, yes. Okay. And uh, now the uh, answer that seems to be uh, the answer of choice to our audience today for uh, the second statement, uh, Stability with time and environment conditions are the main deciding factors for capacitor selection. Most of our audience answered true to that statement. Yes, and that's absolutely the correct answer. This is, in fact, the, the main criteria, the pivotal point for uh, when choosing capacitors for such capacitive power supplies. Okay. And uh, sentence three, uh, both film and ML MLCCs are well suited for these applications. 96% uh, of our audience has answered true to that as well. Yes, so of course, this was a very easy one because we, all, uh, we already emphasized it uh, on a couple of slides where, where we, use the, we use the process of elimination for eliminating out technologies that don't really fit these sort of requirements. So for these as well, um, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's very obvious that both film and MLCCs are well suited for these applications. So this was an easy one. Okay. Number four says non-safety rated series are preferred when driving low current loads. And this one was a split, 50% uh, true, 50% false. So usually as also demonstrated in this, in, in this presentation, uh, when, when, the safe, when the capacitor is safety rated, it is, it is of course built off a more conservative internal design, which means that its current carrying capability is usually not that high. So it, it, it is not maybe at many cases, or for many cases, it's not very well suited for driving, uh, for driving loads that, that need uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of current. But if, but if the requirement is uh, that the loads do not need a lot of current or if, or if it's a low current load, then for sure the non-safety series would be, would be the preferred, or oh, sorry, then the safety series would be the preferred one. So the non-safety rated series are preferred when driving high current loads. So the, the real answer, so the answer for this question should be false. Okay. All right, so moving on to number five. Um, Non-safety rated uh, CAN MLCC or film R75H can be used if a resistor in series is present. 65% have answered true. Yes, so that's a true statement and that's an easy one because 
when because we have seen that if uh, that if 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 the capacitor is not safety rated, then to prevent yourself against the catastrophic failure in case of a very very rare event of a short circuit, uh, you need a you need a resistor in series, and and the and the risk of a short circuit is typically reduced when using a safety rated capacitor. And this is why the non-safety rated capacitors such as CN or R75H can be used only or are usually used when a resistor in series is present. All right. And number six says uh, IRMS and impedance Z at 50 hertz cannot be theoretically deduced based on the data for 100 hertz for films and MLCCs. Um, 54% of our audience have selected false to that sentence. Yes. So right. this is what we also showed on a couple of slides where I demonstrated for film capacitors as well as for, for MLCCs that how can you theoretically deduce uh, the values at 50 hertz when you have the data for 100 hertz available with you. Okay. And uh, number seven says higher capacitances with film caps make it more suited for loads requiring higher currents, true or false, and 85% of our audience have selected true. Yeah, well, that's a, so that's a correct answer. This is a true statement. And this was also one of the points of comparison that was covered in, in, my, in my second last slide. All right. And finally, X7R is more suited for capacitive supplies than C0G. And this one was a clear winner. 81% uh, have answered false. Yes, this was an easy one. Yes, I don't need to say much about this. That why is this, why is this a false <laughs> statement? Yes. All right. So with that said, we have actually one more question uh, before we adjourn um, that came from our audience. And the question says, this question is not directly linked to capacitive supply. It is a general question regarding the film cap. It has a DC voltage rating and AC voltage rating. What is behind those ratings? Thermal or dielectric strength? It's a, it's a combination of both. Of course, with film capacitors, it's a, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. It's, it's not easy to deduce theoretically. If you're talking about the DC rated, uh, if you're talking about the rated DC voltage of a film capacitor, there, there's not one mathematical relation based on which I can say that if this is the DC rated voltage, then for sure, this would be then also the, the AC rated voltage or if we should divide it by two for, R, R, uh, for RMS or, or whatever divide by square root two or something. This is completely a phenomena, which is a, which is a combination of both uh, mainly the internal electric, dielectric, uh, construction and how the capacitor is constructed internally. And then of course, also then your terminals and your leads and your entire connection comes into the picture. So it's, so it's an amalgamation of all the things that lead to the construction of a film capacitor that, that, that determines its, its DC and AC rated voltage. And also the AC rated voltages use a different sort of metallization than the DC link capacitors do. And this is why I had also eliminated a DC link capacitor from such AC supplies because typically a DC link capacitor, uh, although it's a film capacitor, it can work with both polarities. It is not usually recommended for AC applications. So again, also the metallization construction and the inner uh, constituents of metallization play a role here. So it's more complicated than what it maybe looks like for MLCCs. Okay. Well, with that said, that brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, thank you very much, Pranjal, for being part of this uh, this morning or afternoon ready for you. Thank you to all of our audience for attending our webinar, and we hope to see you next time. Until then, have a good day and goodbye.